So now we get to the final part of my rookie prospect profiles. We've already run through my top 12 non-quarterback players, talked through some fades and targets in the second, third, and fourth rounds of your rookie drafts. But now we have to discuss this quarterback class that has some serious potential to be one of the greatest classes in recent history. So let's just start at the top, my rookie quarterback one, which hasn't changed since day one. And it's still Bryce Young because what he was able to do at Alabama with less talent around him than previous Bama quarterbacks is really nothing less than amazing. Over 8,000 yards and 79 touchdowns with only 12 interceptions in two seasons with a season high of over 4,800 yards and 47 touchdowns back in 2021, which won him the Heisman in that season. Bryce Young has everything that you want in a quarterback in terms of accuracy, strength, IQ, and he's very mobile both in the pocket and while scrambling. He's even reported to be the top quarterback in the S2 cognitive test this year, which matches with other elite NFL quarterbacks like Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, and Drew Brees. The only issue that people have with him is his size, as he's 5'10", 204 pounds. That's the only issue in his entire profile. If he was 6'3", 220, we'd be talking about him in the company of like Trevor Lawrence, Joe Burrow, Andrew Luck is one of the best prospects in recent history because he's that good of a quarterback. And because of that, I don't care about his size like at all. And I recognize that's essentially betting on an outlier, but I don't care because I think he is that good. And when he goes first or second overall in the NFL draft, that's the NFL then telling us that they don't care either. So Bryce Young is my rookie QB1 and my Superflex 1.02, and I don't think that there's really going to be anything that is going to make me change that after the draft. So moving to my rookie QB2, it is CJ Stroud, who statistically and talent-wise is essentially just 98% of what Bryce Young is. Stroud is a phenomenal passer with pinpoint accuracy and great arm strength. He's not as mobile as Bryce Young, or at least didn't show a willingness to be as mobile in college, so that is one difference in favor of Young for me, but Stroud does have the more prototypical size for an NFL quarterback at 6'3", 214. So in terms of safety, I think that that can push him ahead of Bryce Young for people who are much more risk averse when evaluating these quarterbacks. My only real concern with Stroud is the weapons that he was throwing to at Ohio State, which I get is kind of a weird concern, but in just two years as a starter, he was throwing passes to four first round picks and another probably second rounder next year too. Now, obviously, that's not his fault that Ohio State is just great at recruiting and developing these wide receivers, but it is something that's just like in the back of my mind of asking myself, like, what if Stroud was elevated by his receivers and it's not the other way around? And I'm not saying that Stroud is a bad quarterback, but it's more in terms of what he may need in the NFL to be a great fantasy quarterback. If he doesn't have great weapons, does that make him like Derek Carr at best? Maybe Mac Jones? That's not really ideal for me. If he has one good option, is he now Kirk Cousins, Phillip Rivers, Matt Ryan? Is it going to take two top 10 guys to turn him into Joe Burrow as a really good pocket passer who's throwing for almost 5,000 and 35 or 40 touchdowns a year? These are the questions that I have about CJ Stroud. And I'm kind of worried about if he goes to Carolina and has just DJ Chark and an old Adam Thielen to throw to, and it takes them a couple years to put weapons around him. Even in Houston, unless they take Jackson Smith and Jigba at 12, it is now Stroud and what, a rookie wide receiver in 2023, a second rounder like Josh Downs or Cedric Tillman. That doesn't really sound great for the type of pocket passer that Stroud is early on in his career. Obviously, they can do much more later on in his career, but early on, for the first couple of years, it really couldn't be that great. And this really isn't a concern for me that I have with Bryce Young because he had the same production as Stroud in college over two years, but with lesser talent. Only one first rounder, Jameson Williams, one official second rounder in John Mechie, and then I don't consider Ja'Cory Brooks or any of the other weapons that he was thrown to this year better than like a third rounder. I feel more confident in Bryce Young's ability to elevate his receivers in the NFL based on what he did in college than what Stroud has shown me so far in his college tape. Maybe that's an oversight on my part. I totally get that that could be, but that's what I'm seeing right now. And it's not enough to move me off of Stroud being my QB two, but these are just the minute differences between him and Young that separate them for me at the top. But let's move into my QB three, Anthony Richardson, the ultimate boom bust player in this class. And let me tell you, I've bought into Anthony Richardson more and more as draft season has gone on. Or should I say, I bought more into Anthony Richardson, the dynasty asset, more and more because I'm still skeptical on Anthony Richardson, the quarterback. But as a dynasty asset, 
he may be the best investment that you can make at quarterback in this class. The way I see it, as long as Richardson is a top 10 pick in the NFL, I don't really blame anybody for taking him at 1.02 behind Bijan as the QB1 in this class. Because think of it this way, if Richardson has a chance to play at least half of the season in 2023 as a rookie, he's probably gonna be a fantasy QB1 during that stretch just because of what he can do on the ground. That's how broken fantasy scoring is for quarterbacks. Think of Justin Fields' production this past year, year one and year two Josh Allen type of production where you're just starting him because he runs for like 70, 80 yards a game, maybe scores a touchdown or two, and whatever he does through the air is really just gravy on top for an additional like eight to 10 points is like a floor. The ceiling is really from the rushing upside. And if Richardson does that, his fantasy and dynasty value is going to spike so much and he'll probably be a top seven dynasty quarterback just like justin fields is right now but even if he is still a top 10 pick but doesn't start right away he'll still hold dynasty value because we just haven't seen it yet and he has the same fantasy upside we're just waiting on him to actually play the best example of this recently is trey lance who is still being sold for first round picks in superflex leagues this year and i've seen as high as 1.02 this offseason for trey lance Lance has held basically like 90% of his value two years later while only playing like three games because his ceiling is the exact same as what it was when he came into the league. We're just waiting on him to actually play. And that's, I think, the floor for Anthony Richardson if he hasn't really given you production in the first year or two. You'd still be able to sell for comparable value as you bought him for over the next couple of years. But then there's the upside. The upside on Anthony Richardson is you really just hit on a game-breaking player for fantasy, literally the next Lamar Jackson or Cam Newton, and that is almost priceless. So while Richardson is a risk-reward type of player by definition, the risk doesn't really seem like risk if you're able to sell for the same kind of value in a year or two, but the reward the reward is just straight cash, homie. So the way I see it, this quarterback class is really all about how you play Dynasty. If you're risk averse, CJ Stroud is probably the guy that you want to take. If you just want to swing for the fences, go for the home run swing, go for Anthony Richardson. But if you just want a hyper talented player who probably is the first overall pick in the NFL draft, then that pick for you is Bryce Young. I really don't have an issue with anyone's rankings of these top three. Just take whoever you want or who actually ends up falling to you if you have 103, 104, 105, and one of those guys is Jared. Just take that guy. Now, after the big three, we get to my QB for Will Levis, who I think is actually quite underrated by the Dynasty community. We can all agree that Anthony Richardson has the highest ceiling for fantasy in this class, but I honestly believe that Levis is close behind him on that list this year. He's a mobile quarterback with a cannon of an arm and actually has much better numbers and tape on him as a pocket passer than Anthony Richardson. In two years at Kentucky, Levis posted over 5,000 yards and 43 touchdowns with Wandale Robinson as his best wide receiver and absolutely no help from the offensive line. And because of that, I think that's where a lot of Levis's issues stem from, his 24 interceptions and his questionable decision-making at time. I think that all traces back to Levis just trying to do too much and take matters into his own hands. But I believe that if you stabilize the offense around him, you give him good weapons to throw to, quality coaching, he can be Josh Allen or Jalen Hurts in the NFL. And there's really only one dream landing spot for him where he can have all of that immediately in 2023, and that's the Indianapolis Colts. You put Levis on the Colts behind what has been a great offensive line up to just this past year with Michael Pittman, Alec Pierce, Jelani Woods, maybe another 2023 rookie in there too, and you have Jonathan Taylor helping take the pressure off in the run game and another great option to dump off to when he's in trouble, and with Shane Steichen at the helm who just turned Jalen Hurts into a superstar and took Philly to the Super Bowl, you put Will Levis in Indianapolis at pick three or four overall, and I think Will Levis is a top six pick in Superflex Leagues. I think he has to be. He can be what Jalen Hurts was in 2021 before he got A.J. Brown, which was a top seven quarterback in fantasy points per game, or be what Josh Allen was before he got Stephon Diggs, which was a top five quarterback in his second year as well. There's gonna be growing pains, absolutely, but that's just the type of player that Will Levis is coming into the league. But with coaching and stability, I think he can be a fantastic quarterback in the NFL and for fantasy. Now, if he doesn't go to Indianapolis, of course, then that's a different conversation. If he's still a top 10 pick, just not with Indy, I'm still taking him in the first round of rookie drafts, probably around 109, 110, depending on how the rest of the players shake out. If he's a later first round pick, like in the teens or in the 20s, 
He's probably going to be around 2.03 in Superflex leagues for me. But if he falls to the second round, then he's probably just like a late second round pick, just like kind of what Jalen Hurts was back in his rookie year. But I'm really ultimately hoping for Indianapolis, and I'm going to be targeting him hard if he falls to the late first in Superflex leagues if he does land on the Indianapolis Colts. And then lastly, we get to my QB5, and this one's really just gonna be quick because I don't really get it. It's Hendon Hooker out of Tennessee. And the reason that I say I don't really get it is because he's a 25-year-old rookie coming off of a torn ACL. And then I turn on the tape, and I just, I, I just don't see it. I don't see it with Hendon Hooker. He's a good quarterback, but I don't see the difference between him and a lot of other day two picks in the NFL. Like, what does Hendon Hooker have that Desmond Ritter didn't have, or Mason Rudolph, or Colt McCoy? His most popular comp is Geno Smith, which is good when you remember 2022, but Geno Smith was terrible with the New York Jets as a starter early in his career. Drew Locke, also terrible. Jimmy Clausen, also terrible. Maybe in this right situation, is Hendon Hooker like Andy Dalton? Is that Hendon Hooker's ceiling? I don't want to invest a second round rookie pick into a quarterback that I know I'm probably not going to get to start in 2023 because of his injury, in which case I now have a 26 year old quarterback entering his second season who's probably a backup somewhere or maybe at best competing for a starting job on a really bad team. Like, I'm sorry, if you're a Hendon Hooker person, I just, I don't see it, I don't get it. And I'll let someone else take him and get a running back or a tight end that I like more in that second round instead of taking Hendon Hooker. But that's my breakdown on this 2023 rookie class. If you missed my video on guys that I'm targeting or fading in the second and third rounds of your rookie drafts, then you can watch that video right up here.